Namaste and good morning, everyone. Let's start our Tuesday class with the prayers. Om Guru Brahma, Guru Vishnu, Guru Devo, Maheshwara, Guru Sakshat Parbrahma, Tasmai Shri Guru Venamaha, Om Bhurbhavaswa, Tatsa Vitra Vare Neam, Bargo Deva Sedi Mahin, Dio Yona Prachodaya, Astoma Satyamya, Tamasoma Jyotirgamya, Mrityorma Amritam Gamya, Om Sahna Vavtu Sahna Bhunaktu Saviryam Karvavai, Tejasvi Navadhi Tamastuma Vidvishavai, Om Shanti 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 Om. Let's open our Mahabharat books. And we are going to start a new parva, Ashwamed Parva. And we are starting this reading from page number 613. So Krishna says farewell. In Hastinapur, the Pandav takes up the reins of the chariot of the kingdom. Guilt still haunts him. He blames himself for the war and all the death it brought. Krishan, Vyas, and Narad pacify him. They speak to him at length, and at least he has the everyday serenity to discharge his dharma as king. Dhritarashtra spends hours talking to his nephew, and Vidur comforts him as well. Now that the war is over, Krishan and Arjun take to spending their time with each other as they used to in the old days. They go back to Indraprastha and rediscover the places where they first grew close. They wander the gardens of the city and spend hours alone together in the Maya Sabha. They range the forest around Indraprastha, hunting, speaking of everything under the sun of the war and especially the events that led to it. It hardly seems a few days since they were last here, but in fact, 15 years have gone by. They ride out to the Khandav one that they helped Agni burn. It was there that they first met Maya. The thread of time shimmers clear. Its silver strands, Krishna asked Maya to build a sabha for Yudhishthira. And then the tide of fate swept them along. Helplessly, perhaps it began even before that when Dark Panchali entered their lives. That was the very day Krishna first met his cousins, the Pandavas. They were given a wilderness for their patrimony and the avatar raised in the trust in the desolation. Narad came and told Yudhishthira that Pandu was unhappy in Yam's halls. The Rajsu followed and stroked the Ryodhan's envy. Krishan killed Shishupal and everything else had come like a flash flood. The game of dice, Dushashan dragging Draupadi into the Kuru Sabha, the swearing of the oaths of revenge, and then exile. Arjun remembers how he went to Dwarka to ask for Krishan's help. Duryodhan had been there that day. Arjun chose Krishan for his sarthi and that sealed the fate of the Kauravs. Then the war to end all wars. Finally, Yudhishthira on the throne to which he was born. One day, Krishna says to Arjuna, the war is won. Your enemies are dead, and Yudhishthira sits where he belongs, on the throne of Hastinapur. I have served my purpose, Arjun, and I must return to Dwarka. I have not seen my mother and father, and they must be anxious. I haven't the courage to ask Yudhishthira if I can leave. I beg you, ask him for me, Arjuna. If he agrees, I will go. If he says I must stay, I shall. What Yudhishthira wants is more important to me than what I want myself. But tell him, I said, he has his brothers with him to help him rule. He has the wise Vidur at his side. Arjun, you must also 
Let me go now. Before he has finished, the, he sees a tears in Arjun's eyes. Krishna takes his cousin's hand. The Pandav can hardly bear to think of parting from his Sarathi. The 18 days of the war had been the most wonderful days of his life. Krishna had been with him every moment. Fear and triumph, they had shared sorrow and courage. During the war, they had been like one person. Two bodies, but one spirit. Arjun thinks he would not mind reliving his life every day of it, just to be as near Krishna as he had during the war. Arjun cries, You have served your purpose, sir. How can you say that to me? Krishna smiles. I only meant the war, Pandav. I know you need me still, and I need you. I can hardly live without you, my friend. Don't you understand? You and I are not apart from each other. Half Krishna's soul is Arjun. For the first time, Krishna tells Arjun about the anxious night he spent before the day Jayadrath died. He tells him how he told Daru to keep his chariot ready because he would kill Jadrath himself if Arjun could not. He clasps Krishna to him and they sit thus in silence for a long time. Then softly the Pandav says, I will let you go back to Dwarka, but only if you promise to return to us soon. How will I stay away for long? replies Christian. The next day, the two of them ride back to Hastinapur. They spend that evening with Dhritarashtra and Yudhishthir. In the morning, Arjun and Krishna come to Yudhishthir's apartment. They sit chatting pleasantly of this and that, though Yudhishthir's face continues to show signs of a deep grief. After a while, Arjun says, Krishna feels he must return to Dwarka. He says his father will be waiting for him. Sighing, Yudhishthir says, Of course, you must go back to see your father and mother. But, oh my lord, how will we live without you? Krishan only smiles. Yudhishthir wipes his tears and then says, Very well, I will let you go, but on one condition, that you come to me in Hastinapur, just as you used to in Indraprasth, as soon as I think of you. Whenever I needed you, Krishan, you always came. Let that never change. Go now. Go home to Vasudeva and Devaki. They must long to see you. So much has happened in our world since you were last with them. Krishna says, I will be here whenever you need me. That will never change. One war has ended, Yudhishthir, but another greater one is just beginning. You still have the war against yourself to win. The avatar takes leave of his cousins. Satyaki bids the Pandavas farewell. After embracing his friend, Bhim stands in a daze, staring fully, dully ahead of him. After everything they have been through together at death's very gates, parting is hard indeed. Krishna prostrates himself before Dhritarashtra and Gandhari, Kunti, Vidur, Yudhishthir, and Bhim. He takes tender leave of Draupadi, Nakul and Sahadev. Finally, he embraces Arjun, quickly then turns away and climbs into his chariot. Daruk flicks his reins over his horses and Krishna and Satyaki set out for home. The Pandavas stand gazing after the white chariot long after it has vanished from view. When they have driven some way, Krishna lays a hand on his Satya's shoulder. Come, Daruk, now fly. The horses flash across the ground, then rise steeply into the air and go the way of the wind, home to mysterious Dwarka, jewel in the sea. Next chapter, Ashavmeda Yagya. The days pass and his kingdom prospers like the earth blooming in a sacred spring, but Yudhishthir still grieves. One day Vyas returns to Hasnapur. He finds the Pandav king dejected, wasting it. Bhim and Arjun tell the Muni that remorse still torments their brother. Vyas says to Yudhishthir, It seems all our advice has been in vain. You still mourn for what is past, which cannot be recalled or mended. 
your brothers are distraught to see you like this, sir. Your mother is anxious for your health. Sadly, Yudhishthira says, my lord, I cannot help myself, though I try. Before he came, Vyas has already thought of a remedy for Yudhishthira. There is a remedy prescribed of old that will help you subdue your sorrow. Undertake an Ashavmed Yajna. Hope flickers in the Pandav's eyes. He says, the Ashavmed will purify the earth of the sins of war. But a king must have vast resources before he can even think of the Yajna. The war has emptied our coffers. I cannot dream of performing an Ashavmed. Why the commonest sacrifice would tax me sorely. The Ikshvaku king of old, Maruts, treasure lies buried under the Himalaya. I know where the stone vault is and the trove is waiting to be unearthed by a needy king of the earth. How was such a treasure hidden on the mountain? Once Marut wanted to perform a profound yagya and approached Guru Brispati to be his priest. Brispati said, I am the Guru of the Devas of Light, of Indra himself. How can I be the priest of a mere mortal king? Find someone else to be your Ritvik. Marut sought the counsel of Samunis. No ordinary priest would suffice for the yagya he planned. He had need of a great Brahman. He was advised to seek the services of Vrishpati's brother, Sambhat, who now lived in a forest on earth. Sambhat had left Devlok because he could not bear his brother's envy anymore, and Indra always took Vrishpati's part against him. Marut found Sambhat and begged him to be his priest. Sambhat said, I will be your Ritvika Kshatriya. You must first worship Lord Shiva. Only he can give you the wealth you will need for the yagya of yagyas that you plan. Marut of the house of the sun was a Rajrishi. He sat in the Pasya and Shiva blessed him with a treasure like the world had never seen. Marut and Samrat decided to perform the yagya upon the Himalaya. A thousand craftsmen were commissioned to create the golden urns for the sacrifice and build a wonderful yagyashala on the mountain. When Brispati heard who Marut's priest was to be, when he heard about the wealth with which Shiva had blessed that king, he was livid with envy. He grew pale, thin and wasted day by day. Indra asked him, My lord, what ails you? Don't your servants care for your wealth? Brispati said in a low voice, Marut has begun his yagya with wealth won from Shiva, Samrat is his priest. But you are my own priest, the Dev Guru. How can Samrat harm you? Grimly, his master replied, Who can bear to see an enemy prosper? Indra, you must do something to put out the fire in my heart. Indra sent messengers to Marut's court, offering him Brispati's services as priest for his yakya. Marut sent his reply to the dear king, Samrat shall be my Vitru. <clears throat> Furious Indra wanted to cast his vajra at Marut, but Samrat prevented him with his tapasya shakti. Finally, Indra and the other devas attended Marut's yakti and pacified by that king, gave him their blessing. When the sacrifice on the Himalaya was completed, Marut gave away gold by the sack to the Brahmans who had come to chant the Vedas. Shiva had been so generous that even after this, a huge treasure was left over. Gold and jewels to fill a storehouse. Marut had this wealth sealed in a rock chamber on the mountain in a secret place, and he returned to his captain, Ayodhya. As Vyasa speaks, Yudhishthir looks around at his brothers and sees how eager they are. Bhim will do anything to see his brother get over his sorrow and be enthused by something again. Arjun, essential Kshatriya, is always delighted at the prospect of a campaign. For of course, Yudhishthir will send him to ride with the sacrificial horse of the Ashwamed, daring any king to arrest its terrain. At last, a smile dawns on Yudhishthir's face. It is perhaps the first time he has smiled since the war ended. 
he says to Vyas, my lord, let us go to the Himalaya and uncover Maruk's treasure. We will perform an Ashav Medha Yagya. Before anything else, Yudhishthir sends word to Krishna in Dwarka, informing him of their plans. He asks his cousin to come to Hastinapur with his Yadavs for the sacrifice. Suddenly, the eldest Pandav's disposition is transformed. Once more, he seems to look forward to something. There is a light in his eyes again. Vyas smiles to himself. He knows the immediate reason for Yudhishthir's change of heart. The Kuru king loves no place on earth as he does the Himalayas. Where he was born, there is no other place which can comfort him and return peace to his troubled spirit like those holy mountains. The Pandavas leave Yuyutsu to care for Dhritarashtra, Gandhari and Kunti. And on an auspicious morning, they set out for the Himalaya with the force of chariots and men. Word of the Ashwamedha reaches Krishna and he and his Vrishnis set out for Dwarka. They arrive in Hastinapur a month before the Pandavas return. Having quite forgotten the rage that seized him when he saw Duryodhan felt, Balram also rides with Krishna. There is another reason why Krishna arrives early. There is another task for him in the city of the Purus. Abhimanyu's wife Uttara is in mourning. She cannot forget her dead husband. That the time they spent together was so short. Uttara carries Abhimanyu's child in her womb and her confinement is near. <clears throat> Krishna arrives early in Hastinapur because after Ashurthama's curse that the Brahmishis would destroy every unborn ponder. The dark one swore he would restore life to Uttara's child. Great anticipation is alive in the city as the day draws near. At last on the bright still morning, the princess delivers a fine son, but their cries of celebration die on the midwife's lips and a shrill wailing breaks out. With the Satyaki at his side, Krishna rushes to the chamber of her own. They meet Kunti stumbling out from Uttara's room, her face covered, sobbing. Kunti sees Krishna and cries, Only you can save us now. Abhimanyu's son is still born. Oh, he looks almost alive and he is so handsome, but no breath stirs in him and his heart doesn't beat in his chest. It will be the end of the Kuru line if he does not live. You must give life to Uttara's son, Krishna. You must. She falls on the floor and claps her nephew's feet. Gently, Krishna raises her up. He says, I have sworn Uttara's son will live. Even if I have to use up all my punya to give him life. Krishna enters Uttara's chamber. We are dropped these in tears and Subhadra is inconsolable. When Uttara sees Krishna, she jumps up naked from her bed and runs dementedly to him. She also kneels at his feet, Lord, save my child or I will take my own life. She faints and her women lift her up and set her on her bed again. Krishna approaches that bed and sees the perfect infant lying there as he slept. Though his eyes are wide open, they stare glassily and no breath moves his chest. Krishna grows very still. The smile vanishes from his face and his eyes glow uncannily. The women fall hushed. They have never seen him like this before. Krishna gazes intently at just the lifeless child as if the rest of the world has ceased to exist. In a whisper, he asks for holy water, pouring some into his palm. He murmurs quiet words over Uttara's child and sprinkles the water over him. The air in the room is electric. No one stirs. Why? They hardly breathe for the dhyan of the blue god. In a trance, Krishna takes the baby in his hands. Unearthly light is upon the avatar. He shines like the night sky when a full moon rises into it. The child is limp in his hands. Slowly, Krishna passes his hands along the infant's body, from his feet up over his legs, his belly and chest to his fine head. The women in that room can almost see the brown passing from Krishna's fingers into the unbreathing child. Krishna says, if I have always served dharam, let this child have life. The baby stirs, his limbs twitch, his tiny mouth puckers up. A spark of life ignites in his eyes. 
Next moment, he kicks his legs and begins to cry in a magnificent little voice. In a dream, Uttara's eyes fly open. In a dream, she hears her son crying. In an incredulous dream, she sees a radiant Christian bring her baby to her, a living child that wails for her breast. In an ecstasy, Uttara takes her son in her arms. Around them, the other women stand frozen, like women in a painting. Christian turns and smiling, walks out of the room. A tumult of joy breaks out behind him. Christian comes out of Uttara's door. Now, sweat streams down his ashen face. His body is drenched in it, trembling. He staggers down the passage to a dark corner. He looks as if he has aged a hundred years. Since he went into Uttara's room of labor, Christian thinks he's alone. Satyaki stands at the far end of the passage and seeing his cousin comes forward quietly. Christian crosses unsteadily to a stone seat in an echo and sits on it. His chest heaving, Satyaki stops himself when he sees the state in which Christian is. He stands in the shadows watching as the avatar shuts his eyes and yokes himself in the hand. Krishna slips into Samadhi. Satyaki stands watching him. Gradually, the dark one stops shaking. Satyaki sees the unearthly light that enfolds him, pulsing. Krishna sits for some moments, wrapped in the light. When his breathing is even again and the color flushes back into his face, the mystic light begins to fade until it vanishes. As long as he lives, Satyaki will never forget those moments. Krishna was so far away then. He could have been on another world or in another color. Satyaki stands transfixed by what he has seen. And then Krishna opens his eyes. The familiar, slightly mocking smile is back on his lips. He is quite himself again, as if nothing exceptional had occurred. Satyaki approaches him with folded hands and says, Abhimanyu lives in Uttara's child. This is a greater victory for you than the war. Krishan takes his hand and says quietly, Yes, Satyaki, this was harder than winning the war. But come now, surely it is time to celebrate. Arms linked, they walk back to the main palace. A month passes. Then word comes to Hasnapur that the Pandavas are on their way home. Following Vyasa's directions, they have discovered King Marut's treasure trove. With Dhammi, their priest, Yudhishthir and his brothers worship like Lord Shiva on the Himalaya. Then they excavated the mountain and when they dug 50 hands, they found a buried rock chamber. In it lay an unimaginable hoard, wealth like the Pandavas had not owned even during the days of the Raj Surya Yagya in Indraprastha. They found gold and golden vessels, chests and caskets full of incredible jewels. It took them 10 days to bring up the treasure. It was loaded onto elephants' backs and in chariots, and a thousand men helped carry it all back to Hastinapur. Miraculously, the Kurus were masters of untold wealth once more. The entire city has turned out to welcome them home. Indeed, on the very day they discovered the treasure on the Himalaya, Abhimanyu's son was born in Hastinapur, and Krishna restored him to life. The palace in Hastina is a temple of hope, surging again through the kingdom. Even the forlorn Subhadra hardly cries anymore, but grows engrossed in the little one, her grandson. Krishna gives the heir to the Kuru throne the name Vyas Muni wanted. He is born after the war, and he has already known death. He is tested one, let him be called Prikshet. Word ar arrives that Yudhishthir and his brothers have returned. Krishan rides out of the city to receive his cousins. Yudhishthir jumps down from his chariot and runs to the dark one, and they embrace. A sea change has come over the Kuru king. His dejection has vanished. Instead, he glows with new contentment. They are a wealthy kingdom again, and Yudhishthir is not fast rejoicing at this for his people's sake. Besides, the Himalaya has healed a favored son. One by one, the other Pandavas come to embrace Krishna and they tell him about their quest for the treasure. As they enter the city gates, Krishna says to them, Uttara is a mother now. Your grandson is called Prikshita. 
Such joy breaks out on the Pandav's faces. Bhim gives a roar of delight. The Dhishtar cries and he lives. Krishna. I swore he would. Didn't I? They cannot wait to see Prikshit and they ride quickly to the palace. The people crowd the streets to welcome their king home. When they see the wealth of Pandavas have brought, singing and dancing break out and the celebrations last through the night. Back in the palace, Abhimanyu's father and his uncles are hardly put the little prince down and his straggle of gloom in Yudhishthira's heart vanishes when he sees Prikshit and takes him in his arms. They pass the handsome child from hand to hand and the quaintest sight is Bhim holding him in his arms. <clears throat> This is no doubt left in anyone's mind that a bright new time has dawned over the destiny of the Kurus and the time of darkness that Duryodhan brought has ended. Once more, there is a future to look forward to, a future that Abhmanyu's son will rule one day. More enthusiastically than anyone else, Yudhishthir throws himself into planning for that future. Vyas returns timely as ever to Hastinapur. Yudhishthir says to his grandfather, Tamuni, we have treasure now, my lord. If you bless me, I will perform the Ashramid Yagya. Vyas says, the Yagya will purify the earth and all of you of the sin of the killing you saw and did. You must not waste any more time. Yudhishthira has another thought. He goes to Krishna and says, my lord, if it hadn't been for you, we would never have won the war. You must perform the Ashramid Yagya. To exercise us of the sins of Kurukshetra, I beg you, do this for my sake. Krishna laughs. Now I know beyond any doubt that you must perform the Ashwamed. My noble cousin, no other king has the relinquishment you do. You are lord of the earth, king of the Gurus, and are happy to serve you. The performance of the Ashwamed Yagya is a tradition in your royal house. I am content as I am, but my joy increases day by day I, as I see all my dreams being realized. Perform the Yagya, Yudhishthira. To me, it will be just as if I did it myself. Plainly, Krishna means what he says. The truth is that he has been deeply concerned about Yudhishthira. He had feared the Pandav might never recover from his remorse. Now he sees him full of hope at the birth of Riksha. And he is relieved. For the avatar, it is another battle won. Vyas finds an auspicious day for the yagi to begin. The finest white horse in the king's stables is chosen to be the sacrificial animal. Yudhishthira asks, everything is ready, but who will ride with the horse through the kingdoms of Bharatvarsh? Arjun is the archer. Let him go with the horse, says Vyas. Let Bhim, Nakul and Sahadev remain here with you and do whatever needs to be done in Hastinapur for the sacrifice. Yudhishthira turns to a beaming Arjun. My brother, go with our army and invite all the kings of Bharatvarsh to the Ashwamedha. If any of them opposes you, subdue him in battle. But Arjun, as much as you can, avoid bloodshed. Arjun takes the initiatory back. Initiatory back. He sets out in his chariot with the white horse going before him and an army and some Brahmins following. The Pandav goes forth in elation. The people mill in the streets and the thunder of the Gandhi's bowstring resounds through the city. After Arjun leaves, preparations begin in earnest in Hastinapur and Bhim and the twins oversee them. A hundred kings will arrive shortly in the Kuru capital and they must be housed and fitted royally. Another small city comes up quickly within Hastinapur. At its heart is a wonderful Yagishala with golden pillars. Meanwhile, Yudhishthira takes his vows as a sacrifice and sits before the Yagya fire. He is just covered with the skin of a black fox. <laughs> his lions with red silk and a staff in his hand. Vyas and countless other Brahmins gather in the city of elephants to bless the Kuru Emperor. They have come to usher in the new age that is upon the world, the Kaliya, as auspiciously as they can. 
Of course, at the back of their minds, a shadow lingers of the other bloody yagya on Kurukshetra with which the Kali began. But they have seen enough evil for a lifetime. And if anyone thinks of a sort of age, this is that began with such a war, no one says anything about it. They are content to, to mind the day as best as they can. Meanwhile, Arjun follows the white horse through Bharatvarsh. They ride north first and hardly a king dares obstruct them. They turn east and a few lords of the earth have to be quelled with battle. After the war at Kurukshetra, there are hardly any Kshatriyas left in the world with a stomach for a fight against Arjun. West and south, also the Pandav bunkers, and all the kings of the sacred land submit once more to Yudhishthira's sovereignty as they did during the Raj Sui Yad. A month before Arjun rides home, these Kshatriyas begin to converge on Hastinapur with their legions for Yudhishthira's or sacrifice. They bring treasures for the Kuru Emperor. The awareness of a new age is upon them all, and they come keenly to the Kuru capital to forge and renew their ties with the most powerful monarch in the world and to establish a new peace on earth. Bhim and the twins, they have seen to it that Hastinapur is splendid with its new mansions and sabhas. <clears throat> the guests are wonderstruck by the Yagyashala that stands at the heart of the city, reminiscent of another sabha in another city, <clears throat> a sabha that sparked with such envy that a war to end all wars was fought in the world. Bhim, of course, is in charge of the kitchen that serves the visiting kings. And it can be safely said the fear in Hastinapur is even more extraordinary than it was 15 years ago in Indrapur. For in between, Bhim had served a year in Virat's kitchen and he had learned a good deal of the culinary art during that year. With a typical humility, Yudhishthir receives his guests, shows them to the mansions where they will stay. All the kings have arrived, and at last one day the white horse canters into Hastinapur. With Arjun just behind it, Dhritarashtra and Yudhishthira go out to the gates to welcome home the conquering Kshatriya, and the city begins its celebrations. The next morning, with Vyas and his hundred rishis presiding over the ritual, the horse is sacrificed to the gods. The animal is cut into pieces, and then Draupadi, the queen, is made to sit next to these. The Brahmans then cook the marrow of the dead steed and the Pandavas sniff the fumes with the boiling marrow, which would remove every stain of sin from them. The other portions of the horse is fed to the sacred fire and for the second time Yudhishthira is crowned emperor of Bharatvarsh. Those who were there say that the Pandavas, Krishna and all the Yadavs are present at Yudhishthira's Ashwamyad Yagya. But the other kings who attend are either sons or nephews of the lords of the earth that came to the Raj Suya in Indrapur. Their sires and elders have all perished in the war. The Yagya is concluded and the Yudhishthira, the sacrificer, turns to his grandfather Vyas and says, Take all this earth we have conquered, Muni, as our gift to the Brahmans who came to our sacrifice. The performance of the Ashwamedh Yagya requires the sacrificer to give all his lands as arms. The custom was seldom observed literally. Only a token offering was made. Vyas replies, I return this gift to you, my child. We Brahmins have no use for lands, but we have use for gold. Yudhishthira is insistent. Not my brothers or I can keep what rightfully belongs to the Brahmins. Vyas says, we are moved by your generosity, but give the Brahmins gold and keep the lands for yourself. Yudhishthira is about to protest against. When Krishna says, do as the Muni says, Yudhishthira, he knows best. Yudhishthira gives the Brahmins millions of gold coins, as well as the gold vessels from King Marut's hold that was used at the Yagya. One by one, the visiting kings depart. Dazzled by the sacrifice, overwhelmed by the wealth and the generosity of Yudhishthira Chakravarti. Just as the Ashwamedh Yagi is being wound up, the queerest thing happens. In the midst of the Brahmins, the Pandavas and Vrishnis, a blue-eyed 
Mangu's next disappearance. He is an extraordinary creature, for a half his belt is shimmering gold. The Mongoose speaks to the Kuru king and the others in perfect human speech. Yudhishthir, your yagya isn't half as great as the sacrifice of the Kurukshetra Brahman. The Brahmans and Kshatriyas crowd around the exceptional creature. One priest says, everything at this ashrama has been conducted according to these Shastras. What fault do you find with it? The mongoose laughs. It isn't a lie, I tell, and I don't speak from vanity. But neither your yagya nor your king's generosity is equal to those of the poor Brahman of Kurukshetra, whose only offering was four bowls of a brewer. The Munis are incredulous. They say, we have followed the Shastras in every particular. How can you compare the poor Brahman's sacrifice with this one? The Mongus replies, I was there at the Yagya of Yagyas, and just seeing it made half my body turn gold. Listen, if you want to hear about that sacrifice. Long ago in Kurukshetra, a Brahman lived on the grain that his neighbors, the farmers, threw away. This hardly amounted to anything. And he, his wife, his son and daughter-in-law ate but once in three days. Sometimes they ate only once in five days, barely keeping body and soul together. A terrible drought fell upon that land. It did not rain and the earth grew parched and all the fields dried up and lay desolate. The poor Brahmin's family starved. One day they could not bear the pangs of hunger that tore at them and went to forage for some food. After wandering for hours in blazing heat and blinding dust, and they often collapsed from weakness, they managed to collect a few handfuls of coarse barley and came home with it. They cooked gruel from the added grains. They divided the gruel in four bowls and sat to eat when a guest arrived at the door, a stranger. The Brahman rose and offered him a place at his table. The silent stranger came in and sat down. Shyly, the Brahman set his bowl of gruel before the man. The stranger quickly ate that gruel. He looked upon, he looked up when he had finished and he was not satisfied. The Brahman was embarrassed, hardly knowing what to do. His wife called from the kitchen. She pressed her bowl into her husband's hands and said, Give the visitor my gruel as well. If you can go hungry, so can I. Almost in tears, he gave her portion to the stranger. In no time, the guest licked the second bowl clean, then looked around, obviously not sated still. The Brahmin's son called his father and pressed his uneaten gruel into his hands. I too can starve, father. Let our guest eat. The Brahmin began to protest, but his son was admin and the stranger had the third bowl of gruel. He still looked around him hopefully. The daughter-in-law called the old Brahman and handed him her bowl. The Brahman said, no, my child, I cannot take this from you. She would not listen and the fourth bowl of gold was also set before the stranger. And he emptied it quickly as if it was the finest delicacy he had ever tasted. Suddenly the stranger's body shone with heaven's light. He said, Brahmans, your generosity isn't of this world. A shower of battle rain fell in that humble home. Its fragrance was divine. The poor Brahman and his family stood astonished. Their guest went on. Your generosity has earned you a place in Devlok. He pointed through the door. Look, Lord Inder has sent a demand for you. Your sacrifice is greater than any Ashwamya, the Rajsuya. Come, let us go. The poor Brahman family followed the stranger into the demand. And he took them into the heaven. I had been hiding in my corner, watching all this. And when the Brahmins flew away with the messenger, I came out. I was also hungry. And I saw that a few drops of the barley pool had fallen onto the floor. Oh, it smelled so wonderful, better than any other food. I crept up and licked up those fallen drops. And at once half my belt turned golden. 
Since that day, my friends, I make it a point to visit every yogi in the land of Bharat to see if I can turn the other half of myself golden. So far, though I have been at countless sacrifices, a Raj Suya and an Ashwaya among them, I have not found a yagya to match that of the Brahman or of Kurukshetra. Look, the proof is upon my belt. Only half of me is gold. Yudhishthar, non-violence, self-restraint, contentment, uprightness and gentleness, sincerity, austerity, truthfulness and charity are superior to the greatest ritual sacrifices. All the fine offerings of your yagya are not equal to a few drops of the poor Brahman's ruin. With that, the mongoose vanishes. Krishan stands smiling to himself and all the others have something to ponder. Soon it is time for their royal guests to depart. <clears throat> and last of all, <clears throat> Krishan, Balram, Satyaki and their Yadavs leave Hastinapur to return to Dwarka on the ocean. Though the Ashwamedh Yagya might not have been as great as the poor Brahman sacrifice, it does wash their sins of the war from the Pandavas. Peace returns to Yudhishthira's spirit. The nightmares that ravaged him since Kurukshetra no longer stop his sleep. With Prikshit as their hope for the future, the sons of Pandu begin a long and blessed reign from Astana. So we'll, uh, this is the end of this uh, part of also. So we'll start the next part next week. The passing of the elders. Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachate Purnase Purnamadai Purname Vavsheshate Om Shanti Shanti Shanti